We're going to be reading in here contemporary fiction uh, this semester, contemporary Southern fiction, which means for us, fiction written in the last 20 years by writers who are still at it, still alive, and still producing. <clears throat> but before we begin to look at that contemporary fiction, I think it would be good for us today to get a little historical perspective on, on uh, fiction, Southern fiction in the present. And if we look at the term Southern literature, we find, obviously, that it's got two parts. It's got a South part and it's got a literature part. <clears throat> I hope by the time you're done with the course, you know a little bit more about both those things, both about the American South and about uh, its fiction. So let me talk for a few minutes this morning about the South. The South is a a big topic that's drawn commentary from a lot of people, a lot of it humorous, by the way. Uh, it's difficult even to define the South as a, as a region, but it has fascinated generations of observers now. To this day, it, it's still true that uh, Americans think of the South as a distinctive region that's got its own peculiar cuisine. Um, has its own distinctive uh, music that originated from it, <clears throat> its own rituals, its own history, its own patterns of speech. Uh, there have been a, a lot of attempts to define the South, to say exactly what it is and exactly where its borders are. <clears throat> some of those have been serious attempts and some of them funny. Uh, one attempt to define the South <clears throat> was made by uh, by David Smiley of Wake Forest University, who um, used to claim in his, in his uh, classes on the history of the South that you could establish the borders of the South by establishing a grit line, you know, a G-R-I-T line, <laughs> a grit line. And he said the way you could do it is <clears throat> you start in Atlanta and you send out a group of, uh, say, students in different directions. Well, you can leave out the east because the ocean pretty much stops you there. But send them north and send them west. And uh, the way you establish the grit line is every morning you pull off the, the highway and go to a restaurant for breakfast and order grits. And if they don't serve grits, you know you're outside of the south. Okay, so grit line. Was, was what uh, David Smiley think you could use to establish the borders of the South. Actually, I think um, iced tea would probably work just as well. You know, if you ask for iced tea and they automatically bring it to you already sweetened, you're in the South. And if you have to add your own sugar or sweetener, you're outside the South. That'd be another possible way to do it. Um, all right, so humorous ways to establish the borders. Uh, other ways to say what's distinctive about the South have <clears throat> focused more on speech. Uh, a book popular a few years ago that's, that's still available, in, that's still in print, is called How to Speak Southern. Anybody ever heard of that before? Um, as I say, you can, you can still get it, and it's got uh, lots of phrases that uh, are, are designed, uh, according to the author of the, the book, to help uh, people who've moved to the South from somewhere else understand how people here talk. Jeff Foxworthy is a comedian who's made a career. Out of, well, now he's uh, doing a show called Are You as Smart as a Fifth Grader? Isn't that the name of it? I think that's the name of it. Um, but for a long time, he, uh, all his comedy routines had, had the, the theme of a, of a redneck. And one of the, the things that he's done is to write a redneck dictionary. Okay, so speech has, has been important uh, for, for saying what's special about the South. Just the expression, y'all, uh, can occasion a long discussion. You know, for example, is y'all singular or plural? Plural? Yeah, so that's, a, that's the right answer, I would say. Uh, but some people uh, would claim that, that, it's, that it's singular. Actually, it drives me up the wall when somebody uses it as a singular. Um, all right, well, uh, the conviction that Southerners have unique linguistic patterns 
has contributed to the idea that the South has a distinctive literature. Um, and it is true to, to a large degree, especially in its origins, Southern literature grew out of oral culture, out of how people talk. If you go back, for example, to the early decades of the 19th century, that's the 1800s, um, you'll find that fiction from the South was <clears throat> often identified with regional speech. Uh, one group of writers from that period who were very popular across the country are usually called the Southwest humorist, uh, humorist of the old Southwest. And they included writers you may not have heard of, like Augustus Baldwin Longstreet and George Washington Harris. But one of the um, features of the stories that these guys wrote, who were also sometimes called local colorists, uh, there were always colorful characters uh, who spoke in unusual ways that, that people, especially in, in the cities, found um, amusing, unusual. Um, entertaining. Uh, George Washington Harris, for example, his favorite character, the character everybody liked, was called Sut Loving Good. And Sut Loving Good was a ne'er-do-well, uh, later he might have been called a, a redneck, a guy who just sort of hung around, <clears throat> certainly appeared to be lazy, but he was uh, sharp-witted and he always had a good story and no matter what scrape he got into, he always managed to get out of it by telling a story uh, or by some exercise of, of uh, cleverness. Um, okay, well those were the kind of stories popular in, in one important branch of early uh, Southern literature. Mark Twain is the, the great writer uh, most directly influenced by this, by this tradition. If you read a little bit of Mark T Twain, you know that, that Mark Twain loves the tall tale and um, has a great ear for, for dialect uh, and uh, the regional dialect uh, from, in, in his case, uh, primarily from, from Missouri, um, is an important part of the appeal of, of what he writes. Okay, so um, the tall tale, frontier humor, stories that uh, started out around campfires and uh, in courthouses and country stores, farm tables, the oratory of the courtroom and of the pulpit. These were all um, early sources of, of Southern literature. Into the 20th century, uh, when we get great writers that immediately precede the writers we're talking about, writers like Eudora Welty and William Faulkner, who were both from Mississippi. Uh, these are writers, Welty, for example, will talk about growing up <clears throat> in a culture of storytelling, uh, especially in the days before air conditioning. What people did on long, hot summer evenings was to hang out on the porch. Everybody had a porch uh, with, a, with a railing and rocking chairs. And uh, the telling of stories in an intimate setting of family where neighbors could also wander up, uh, that was just part of the, the ethos and uh, the context for writers well into the, the 20th century. The transition from a, a, um, a social, social culture where telling stories was, was natural and inevitable even, transition from that to writing seemed an easy one uh, for uh, a number of, of Southern writers. Another f feature of early Southern literature is the bizarre and grotesque. Um, one, one writer that you might not think of as a Southern writer, but he was uh, often cited as the father, especially of Southern Gothic, um, is, a, is a famous writer who wrote uh, tales of uh, well, great psychological realism, but also of decayed mansions and strange things happening to people who might come back from the dead. Uh, you know who I'm talking about? The early, the writer from the 19th century who writes strange tales, sometimes made into movies. You probably have read some of them somewhere along the way. Maybe at Halloween, 
buried in Baltimore, from Virginia. Edgar Allan Poe? Yeah. Edgar Allan, is that what you were saying? Yeah, okay. Yeah, speak up. Yeah, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, um, uh, is a, from, from Virginia, and um, uh, often cited as the, the father of, of Southern, Southern Gothic. Uh, so, bizarre and grotesque events, um, kind of a sensational psychological allegory, uh, that also is, is part of the history and origin of, of Southern literature. Okay, well, um, while all these things are important, distinctive speech, strong oral traditions, distinctive literature, all these things are important, uh, most serious attempts to, to define the South or say what's most distinctive about it have concentrated on history rather than on, on literature or speech, concentrated on on history. <clears throat> and um, two aspects of history where the South is concerned uh, are especially important in talking about what's distinctive about the South. The, the two things are connected and um, both of these things are, are ugly things, ugly realities. The first is slavery. The first is slavery and the second is the Civil War. Um, so. Let me talk uh, a little bit about, about each of those two. <clears throat> First of all, where slavery is concerned, um, it's important to say that slavery in the U.S. is not uniquely a Southern problem. Uh, I think people often have that kind of uh, misperception. They think that uh, slaves, that only uh, uh, the South had slaves. Um, and that uh, it was throughout our history uh, uh, a, a problem confined to that region of the country. That's far from true. Um, closer to the truth, just to give a, a brief overview, is this. Most of the slave trading <clears throat> was done through New England ports. Boston, for example, and Newport, Rhode Island are ports where fortunes were made in the slave trade. Um, the reason that we don't uh, think of that, while it, where it's not uh, is part of our, our um, consciousness and assumptions, is that <clears throat> while fortunes were made in the slave trade in, uh, through New England ports, most of the actual slaves uh, ended up in the South. Uh, for economic reasons. The um, large-scale agricultural endeavors like you know, cotton plantations eventually, of course, uh, uh, absorbed most of this labor. Uh, earlier, tobacco plantations uh, beginning in Virginia. Uh, plantations, large-scale uh, farm operations, highly labor-intensive, uh, absorbed more slave labor. Slave labor was more uh, effective uh, and, and um, more commonly used there. So <clears throat> while the whole country, the whole of the U.S. from the colonial period was infected with this uh, terrible uh, problem, disease of slavery, it was in the South that, that most of the actual slaves eventually ended up. Uh, if you're interested in that topic, I encourage you to, to uh, pursue it. Uh, it is uh, still for us very much an important topic uh, and, um, and one that, that much continues to be written on. All right, but to get back to the, to the uh, South, because of slavery, because of the wide scale use of, of uh, slaves and, and plantation labor, slavery became uh, in, in the eyes of most white Southerners, vital to the economy of the South. Uh, and that's why as um, abolition movements developed, um, efforts to, to um, free slaves and outlaw slavery, those efforts were much more successful in um, northern states than they were in the South, uh, where there was this deeper entrenched economic interest. So by the time we get to the 19th century, you have um, 
um, in the South, uh, of course the largest concentration of actual slaves, and you also now get to have a le start to have a legal divide between free states, uh, states where there is no slavery, um, and, and slave states. Okay, so by the middle of the century, this um, economic divide has begun to be a, a legal one, um, and that's an important run-up to the Civil War. But before I <clears throat> leave slavery entirely, uh, let me also emphasize that the presence of slavery as an institution uh, that was defended on the battlefield uh, in, in the South also uh, exacerbated, the presence of slavery exacerbated the, the problem of racial conflict and concentrated it in, in the South. You know, once again, uh, many parts of our nation, most of our nation have uh, had to deal with, with uh, racial conflict. But because there were so many African slaves in the South, um, that uh, divide, uh, in, in this case between white and, and black, was a severe one and made the, the issue of racial conflict more volatile and more concentrated in the South than anywhere else in the country. Okay, slavery and related to that race, that's certainly one of the things that makes the South a distinctive region. And related to that, of course, the Civil War. Uh, the question of slavery, whether it could be legal or not, along with related constitutional issues like uh, um, you know, states' rights. Does each state has the, have the right to establish its own uh, laws uh, in, in relation to things like slavery? Those uh, things together led to the Civil War, <clears throat> and it's hard to um, exaggerate the importance of the Civil War for Southern identity. Uh, just a, a quick e example of how that's true, how important the Civil War is. <clears throat> if, you, um, if you look at old stuff in the South, especially old houses, um, one thing you're often told is that this is antebellum. Have you all heard that term before? A-N-T-E-B-E-L-L-U-M, antebellum. Uh, well, does anybody know what that means? It's Latin. Does anybody know what it, what it means literally? Hmm, looks good in purple. Uh, anti, bellum, no takers, bellicose, it's an English word. Uh, it, it means before the war. Okay, so uh, you know, even talking about the architecture as well as other things in the South, this is a, a common term. <clears throat> and what it emphasizes is that the war, the Civil War, uh, is the single greatest event or episode uh, in, the, in the history of, of the South. Um, well, it, it, some of the reasons for why, that's, why the Civil War is so important in the South, more important in the South than, than other parts of the country, some of those are obvious. There's, there's nothing like a war for marking off territory, right? Um, I mean, when you have a war, a line is drawn. There are, are enemies on either side of the line. <clears throat> um, and in this case, the, the lines were the, the borders of, of states. Okay, so literally defining moment in pulling uh, the South away from from the, the rest of the, of the country. But the consequences of the war, too, um, uh, especially in the, in the 50, 75 years after the war was over. Um, one modern Southern writer, uh, whom I'm very fond of, Walker Percy, put it this way. Somebody asked him once, uh, what's different about the South? And he says, we lost the war. Uh, and what he means by that is that the South is the only region of the United States that has been conquered and occupied by a victorious army. Okay. You know, maybe it, it, we'd make an exception with Native Americans. You know, all of Native Americans, I guess you could say, they were invaded and, and defeated and taken over. 
But if you talk about um, <clears throat> legal jurisdictions within the president, the present uh, United States of America, South is the only part of the country to know defeat, to know defeat uh, in war, to go through that particular kind of, of humiliation. Um, and uh, scholars who've looked at, at the South in its literature have seen great consequences uh, and, and significance in, the, in this fact uh, that this, the South has, has known defeat. Um, to some degree, losing the war has gave the South for a long time, I would say, a kind of inferiority complex where the rest of the nation was concerned. The defeat act uh, uh, um, certainly had a lot of uh, economic and political consequences for what followed. Uh, but it was in what you might call the mind of the South, the way Southerners thought of themselves, that the impact uh, of, of having been through the Civil War and having lost it uh, was, was greatest. Uh, one final little signal of the importance of the Civil War and, and Southern identity. Um, I think it's significant that uh, the single symbol that <clears throat> most people who, who uh, want to praise the Old South turn to is not the flag of a state, and it's not the flag even of the Confederacy, it's actually a battle flag. You know, the flag that you see that uh, is often just called the rebel flag, the stars and bars, that's actually the battle flag of the Army of Northern Virginia. Okay, so it's not a state flag, it's not even the flag of the Confederacy, it's, it's a battle flag. So it's, it's the war, the Civil War itself um, that has uh, defined much of, of Southern thinking. Okay, well, one might might well say, and sometimes you hear people say, well, big deal, that was then, this is now. Uh, way back when, uh, it might have been true that, that Southerners uh, uh, remembered the Civil War and couldn't get away from it. But things have changed now. Um, you know, we have thousands of people from other, from other areas moving into the South every month. Uh, some people have wanted to say that the South is just part of the Sun Belt now, meaning those places, warmer climates in the, in the U.S. where, uh, for example, people who want to retire uh, go for the, for the better weather. Um, but I think that's a, a little misleading. Uh, a very good book on this subject is written by a historian of the South who, who lives close to us, um, a professor named David Goldfield from uh, UNC Charlotte, wrote a good book a few years ago called Still Fighting the Civil War, in which he insists that uh, the South to this day continues to be uh, defined in many ways and, and characterized by the, by the aftermath of the, of the Civil War. Um, you might know that in South Carolina there's a long controversy over what flag to fly uh, in, the, in the Capitol and, and, where to fl and where to fly it. Um, okay, well, Regardless of, of whether we Southerners are still fighting the, the Civil War, uh, it uh, remains at least an important part of the past for us to be conscious of, and I think we can see echoes of, uh, of um, a, maybe a different view, for example, of uh, tragedy, the possibility for tragedy in the, in the human condition. Uh, and we'll see examples of that as we, as we go along. But um, let me talk about one other topic to do with the characterization of, of the South here before we, we wind up. And that is the, the subject that you could call diversity. Um, one issue that's been raised by observers of the South, especially literary scholars in recent years, has been this. What they have said in effect is, we've talked too much about, about um, the solid South, about the unity of the South. Uh, what we should be talking about is the diversity, the difference within the South. Now, uh, in its extreme form, this view says the South, the idea of the South is just a fiction that uh, people have used often for racist reasons to try to hold on to power and, um, and keep social control. <clears throat> um, 
there's some truth to that. But I think uh, for one to claim there is no unity to the South whatsoever uh, is, is very misleading. What is helpful, though, uh, and, and what um, these critics, I think, can, can allow us to see, is that there is a considerable variety under the kind of umbrella of the South, we might say. And um, in the fiction that we'll be looking at this semester, we will see some of that uh, variety. But just to tip you off to on uh, a couple of ways in which this variety is, is uh, real, some, some of the types of variety that are, that are possible. We've talked a lot about speech. <clears throat> And um, if you hear that a British actor is going to be in a movie starring a southern character, uh, you'll read that uh, they have a, an accent coach. And somebody might say, well, um, uh, Jude Law has to learn a southern accent. Well, actually, there's not a southern accent. There are a lot of different southern accents. Um, uh, and even today, as accents are not as prominent, that's, that's still true give you a couple of personal, I have no trouble telling apart my, the accents of my cousins in Tidewater, Virginia from the accents of my cousins from Nash County, North Carolina. My Tidewater, Virginia cousins say out in a boat, you know, there's a mouse about the house. Um, you know, it's something you don't usually associate with a, a southern accent, but it's, it's very prominent in Tidewater, Virginia. Uh, my, uh, well, certainly my uncles and aunts in Nash County, North Carolina, uh, might have cone for supper. Um, my, my own mother, who was a farm girl from North Carolina, went to a <laughs> drive-in movie when my parents were first married in Virginia, uh, where her accent was not common, and um, had a, got involved in a humorous incident when she went to the snack shop and, and tried to get some cone cheese. <laughs> corn cheese, yeah, the, the, like cheese puffs, uh, but they had no idea what cone was. You know, for them, cone was something that you put, uh, I don't know, uh, cotton candy in, not C-O-R-N. Okay, well, the point is simply that uh, there's not even a single southern accent. There's a lot of, uh, of variety there, and that variety extends to other things, ethnicity, uh, even actual languages, um, versions of English that outsiders have a lot of trouble following. On the Sea Islands of Georgia, there's a language uh, that evolved from, from slaves and former slaves, Gullah, uh, that's, that's still alive. Uh, but it's very difficult for people not from there to, to understand. Tangier Island, a little tiny island in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay, uh, the people who live there, uh, that island was settled by British fishermen. Um, they speak a version of English that was spoken in Shakespeare's time that, again, has an accent that's so strange to, to our ears that uh, if you listen to them talk to each other, you can't understand if you're a speaker of uh, standard American English. Um, okay, so variety within the South. Uh, where the Civil War itself is concerned, during the Civil War, we'll see that not all Southerners supported it. Uh, there's, there's, not, uh, there's not unity there. Okay, well, we will attempt, however, though, to find some, some unity within the diversity. And uh, what we will attempt to do is to, to use a set of themes that um, we'll begin to introduce next time um, that, that will help us uh, identify some strands and what you might think of as a, as a rope with a number of strands together that if we take them all together uh, help to make up the South. <laughs>